Tara Johnson and Wales, and welcome back for All Class Reunion Weekend. It's so awesome to have you all here. Yes. And you're up this morning, and many of you took the tour already, so you're all raring to go, right? Awesome. So I'd like to introduce you to two of our faculty members this morning. The first that I'll introduce is Chef John Poirot, class of 2003, uh, an alum of the university. He's assistant professor at the College of Culinary Arts. He's also a registered and licensed dietitian. And he has been demonstrating um, how Johnson & Wales changes the way the world eats on NBC10, which is the Providence um, affiliate of NBC. So without further ado, Chef Poirot. Morning, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? You guys can hear me? All right, so uh, like she said, I am a graduate of Johnson Wales. I graduated from the culinary nutrition program. Did anybody here take culinary nutrition? One. Didn't have it. It's totally cool. It was brand new. Uh, I think my freshman year was brand new, uh, and they kind of were poaching people from labs and from academics. They're like, hey, you can cook. Hey, you're, you're good in sciences. Why don't you come over here? I was like, all right. It also helped that there's a lot more girls in the culinary nutrition program. I'm like, I'll go this way. That works for me. Uh, so I graduated. I uh, wanted to become a registered dietitian, so I had to do a dietetic internship. I actually did mine in the Army. I spent 10 years in the Army as an active duty Army officer, uh, dietitian. I did everything from med surge, ICU, oh, thank you, um, uh, health wellness. I did all those rotations. And then I found my true passion, which was sports nutrition. And for the majority of my career, I worked with infantry and special operations soldiers, teaching them about high altitude nutrition, cold weather. I worked with aviation pilots, getting them in shape. They've got a lot of weight that they carry in the helmets. They're very static in one position. Uh, I got my personal trainer's license, so I worked the whole facet. Uh, I really, really liked the preventative side of the house, so that's what I was trying to do with them. Uh, I was looking to get out of the Army. I wanted to settle. I had moved six years in, or six times in 10 years. I was done, um, and I just happened to be working at a hospital for my last year. My civilian executive chef, because we ran the food service, him and I, uh, he's a JWU grad as well. Uh, he spent 20 years active. He retired, and he was my, my certified executive chef at the time. We share an office. He's like, hey, bud, just see if JWU's hiring. I'm like, no, they won't be hiring. He's, he's from Fall River. He, he used a couple explicitives, and he was like, just, just put in your application. So I did, and uh, 10 minutes later, uh, our old uh, department chair, Suzanne Vieira, called me up. She's like, you're hired. I'm like, that, but that was a, a, a half-done resume. You know, I wasn't really serious. She's like, no, you got the job. So they brought me back here, and I teach sports nutrition to our seniors, a course called Athletic Performance Cuisine, gearing our nutrition students to one day be sports dietitians, because you still have to get a master's like I did, have to spend time in the field working with patients to build up your resume before you can acquire the credentials to be a certified sports dietitian. Uh, and then we have a whole group of kids now that don't want to be dietitians, but don't want to be restaurateurs, but they like the chef aspect. So we have created this new slot called Performance Chef. And a lot of our students have gone off and are working with professional sports teams and D1 teams across the country. Uh, the executive chef for the University of Alabama football team is a graduate of ours, Culinary Nutrition. Uh, she's been down there for four years, and her contract's starting to expire, and she's getting hounded by University of Alabama, by Clemson, Texas A&M, uh, and two other schools for very lucrative contracts to move or to stay to be the performance chef. So we've got about 10 to 15 students that are grads that are out in the world doing this, and they're kicking butt. They're doing awesome things. And if those teams win championships, they get championship rings and all that uh, fun jazz. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're really changing the way. And then with the TV show, we're trying to promote that preventative measure, that heart-healthy cooking you know, I'll talk a little bit about, hey, if you have diabetes, we want to control your blood sugars. If you've got heart disease or high blood pressure, we want to bring your levels back in alignment, but through whole food concepts, which is what I'm going to do for you guys today, okay? I can get very science and probably about 90% of you will fall asleep, and I don't want to do that. Uh, it's still early in the morning. I want to keep you awake. Uh, so what I'm doing today is actually a technique that our performance chefs use, and it's something that you guys can do at home. This is called uh, sous vide. Uh, you're cooking with an immersion circulator. I bought this one off Amazon, pretty cheap, okay? Um, they've got all sorts of bells and whistles. This one is actually Bluetooth connected to my phone. If I wanted, I could sit on the couch and change the temperature. I'm not that lazy. I actually get up and just rotate this dial right here. It's not hard. Uh, but I'm 
immersion circulator, I'm using a water bath to cook some salmon, okay? What's nice about this is you can preset the temperature, like I've got it set to 120 degrees. It's going to hold at exactly 120 degrees for forever, okay? So you could put something in a water bath before you go to work, kind of like a crock pot, come home, and it's done. Right now, I can take the salmon out, which I did, and I could eat it as is. It's really soft, really mushy. Or you can hard sear it which I like to do. So I'm going to hard sear this in a cast iron pan, get that little bit of crust on there. As you're doing this, you know, we cryovac those bags here because we have cryovac machines. It's, you can do this at home with Ziploc bags. Through uh, water displacement, all you do is you take your Ziploc bag, gently put it in here, and that water pressure will force all the air out. So you have it all the way down, you just close that Ziploc bag, you take one of these clips, clip it on the side, and you're done. All right, so all I have in here is a little bit of olive oil for that heat conductivity. I've got some dill and some lemon zest. I like to promote natural flavors as much as possible. Didn't put any salt on it. I'm going to salt the salmon right now, okay? I'm going to pepper the salmon right now. And I've actually got a little bit of dried garlic powder, which I will use uh, on this also. There are times where I love to use fresh. There's times where I like to use dried. Everybody's like, why dried? it's got a little bit of a subtle flavor, okay? I don't want to punch you in the face with that garlic. I want that back note. Again, as you're building dishes, you want to talk about or do layering flavors. Uh, I tell my students all the time, how many of you have seen the Disney cartoon Ratatouille? Remember that scene where that one rat's describing to his brother rat about the different flavors, and you see those music notes going off, the high, the middle, the low? That's what we want for recipes. We want to be constantly building flavors, different layers of the flavors. So that's where that garlic powder is going to come into play. Over here, I've got that high note. I'm going to be doing a, a farro and quinoa salad with this. Okay, I already pre-cooked the farro. I've already pre-cooked the quinoa because they take a little bit of time. And I didn't quite have 45 minutes with you guys, so I cheated. I'm sorry. Uh, but again, using natural ingredients here. I've got some red onions for crunch. I've got some kale. Let me throw that in there. Now, you can blanch this. You can keep it fresh. I'm going to keep it fresh. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to massage the vinaigrette into that to kind of break it down and get the flavors throughout. Some tomatoes. I'm going to throw some basil in there. And I'll throw some lemon zest and some feta cheese on top in a little bit. So this is about good. Now, when you're doing the sous vide, okay, you have to be careful because it can make your protein very soft and delicate, which this is. It's actually, it'll fall apart if you don't cook it to a uh, high enough temperature. So I'm gonna go very easy on here. Now I already took the skin off. Now you can keep the skin on. In that bag over there, I've got some that has the skin on. It's a personal preference. It's whatever you like. I don't like mushy skin on fish, so I want to either take that off or get it really, really crispy in the pan, okay? You can either take it off beforehand, but actually with salmon, because you're heating it up, you're changing the protein structure, so that skin is very easy just to peel off uh, afterwards. So if you're not too comfortable with filleting fish and taking that skin off, you can kind of cheat and take it off afterwards. So I'm just going to get a nice little sear on that. I'm going to turn this temperature up. So again, I'm already at a temperature where I could eat this. Uh, again, if I'm serving this maybe to athletes or to an elderly population, I'm going to want to cook it all the way. Here at school, our students are love, love to cook this about medium rare. I'm not so much that rare side of the house. I like that more medium-esque personally. So we'll finish off the salad while that's going. Now in here, I've just got some vinegar. Okay, You can use champagne vinegar, or white balsamic vinegar, whatever you prefer. Uh, actually, before I do that, let me throw in some... Uh, whole grain mustard with a little bit of honey. I cheated and heated up the honey so that way it would be easy to stir in here. And I'm going to put a little bit of seasoning in here as well. So that way you get that disbursement throughout that salad. You guys have any questions as I'm doing this? How much am I making? Uh, this is going to be enough for my second breakfast. That's what it's going to be. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't make any samples for you guys. However, Chef Legal over there, um, she knew I was doing healthy cooking, so she wanted to come behind me and show me up. So she's got some samples for you guys of her dish. Did I do anything with the MREs other than eat them and critique them heavily? No, I did not. Uh, I got to go to the factory where they were being produced. 
uh, which was actually pretty interesting. There is a lot of science that goes into it, believe it or not. I mean, some of the infantry soldiers I served with would debate that fact. Um, but there are some newer flavors coming out that are decent. Um, I don't know if I personally would ever eat uh, egg MRE or a shrimp MRE, but uh, yeah, I usually stuck with the vegetarian MREs. So as you can see here, if you guys got the view, I've got that nice crust starting to form on here. I'm just going to let it kiss that other underside. I'll shut the heat off, and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that out in a second and lay it on here to uh, let it rest. Again, when you ever, whenever you cook your proteins, you want to let it rest because it's going to have that carryover cooking aspect. So let that sit for a second, take off some of that oil that was in the pan. Again, we've got nice flavors in this bowl with the farro. Farro is a great grain. Uh, everybody knows about quinoa. Quinoa has been very popular. Farro is kind of one of the ones that are starting to come up, higher in protein, higher in fiber, lots of vitamins. When you cook grains, if you're going to cook different grains at home, please use different pots, okay? They all have different cooking times. If I cooked the farro with the quinoa, the quinoa would just be mush, okay? So you got to make sure you're taking those cooking times uh, as well as how much water goes into it. Uh, every grain has got a different amount of water that needs to be with it. So that's just something, if you have the package, you can read the directions on the package. Uh, if not, you can very easily find a grain cooking chart online. Yes? It just talks about farro. Uh, I did the same amount of quinoa in here. I think I added that last second without putting that in a recipe. I apologize for you guys. Uh, yes, ma'am. Now over here, what we'll do is we'll just top it with a little bit of lemon zest and some cheese. Now the cheese adds obviously some fat and some creaminess to the dish, which is real nice. The salmon, depending on the temperature that you cooked it to, can be really creamy. The nice thing about salmon is because it's a fatty fish, even if you overcook it, you can get away with it because that fat keeps it creamy. So it's a good one if you're unsure about uh, cooking fish to start off with, unlike let's say, halibut or cod that can tighten up on you very quickly. Uh, so we'll throw a little lemon zest on here. You can use any cheese you want, ma'am. I'm using a little bit of uh, feta cheese because that's what I like personally. Goat cheese would be nice with this. And if you didn't want to do cheese, um, you can use a, a Greek yogurt. Maybe make a quick tzatziki sauce. So Greek yogurt, some lemon zest, some shredded cucumber. Let that cucumber drain to get the moisture out and a lot of dill, garlic, um, salt, pepper, and then you could make that sauce on the plate, or you can just put that on top of the salmon right before that goes out if you want that sauce component. Another thing you could do is you could build a pan sauce in here. Maybe take, once the salmon comes out, throw a little bit of butter in there, get it, make it into a brown butter, throw some more herbs in there, uh, and then you can just drizzle that on the plate itself. Again, I didn't want to do that because I want to focus on the heart health aspects of the dish, so I used some omega-3, uh, fats with the salmon, the olive oil. Okay, so again, we're looking at heart health, reducing bad cholesterol in the body. Uh, you've got fiber in the grains over here. So again, fiber binds with fat in the body. Okay, so it helps to bring down cholesterol. It helps to bring down blood pressure. I'm using a little bit of salt. You do need a little bit of salt in your cooking process. That helps to accentuate all the flavors. But the main flavors in here are coming from the basil, from the lemon zest, because I had that in the immersion circulator, the pepper and the garlic powder as well. So when I build dishes, I also think about the time it takes. At home with the family, I wanna get food on the table. I know it sounds a little funny, but within 30 minutes or less. So that can be going all day. I'll come home, maybe I've started prepping the quinoa on a Saturday or Sunday, so I've got that already cooked. It's chilled in the refrigerator so I can take it out. I could turn this into a quinoa and farro fried rice dish, you know, just stir fry it real quick if you wanted it hot. If not, the cold aspect works really nice, especially today. I see a lot of you in shorts. I'm jealous right now. Uh, you get that cold aspect. You get the hot aspect of the salmon. Flavors come together. What questions do you guys have? Sir? Yes. Yes. So you want to cook it for the appropriate amount of time. Again, if I had it at 120 only for 20 minutes and I wanted to go serve it, no. I've had this in there for about two hours, okay? And again, I 
brought it up to temp. It's probably at around that 135 mark right now after the hard sear. So you do want to be careful with food safety. Um, you can be creative when you're, especially let's say you're doing eggs. You can get to the exact degree Celsius that you want your egg yolk cooked, which is pretty cool. It's a fun thing to do. Um, but you just want to keep that food safety in mind. So you do want to take a look at the time and temperature uh, that all these charts have. This machine came with a chart that said for food safety purposes, always cook it for this amount of time at these temperatures. And it gives you a range of temperatures too. So. That one was around $100. Um, you can easily see the brand. I'm not going to say the brand. We're not here to promote brands. Bought it on Amazon, and I actually got it for Christmas this year. I bought one for my brother, and my brother bought one for me, not knowing we got each other the same thing. So I opened my gift. I was like, oh, wait, this one's yours. He's like, no, that's yours. I was like, oh, cool. So, yeah, yeah, it was, it was nice. We definitely played with it that Christmas. You could do vegetables in here. Uh, I've had filet mignon in here. Again, filet mignon, cook it to that medium rare, hard sear it, or rare hard sear it. Uh, my father, I absolutely love that one. I've done sous vide carrots in here. I've done asparagus. I've played with all sorts of things. Eggs for Easter, I had a whole bunch of eggs going in here. Uh, lamb, I've done lobster as well, almost like a butter poached lobster in that bag. So poaching is the original form of sous vide. Again, you take that, that let's say, poached chicken breast, you're going to wrap that up in that saran wrap nice and tight, lay that in the water, poach it delicately. That's exactly what this is doing. Except I don't have to keep fiddling with the controls to adjust the temperature. You know, I set it, walk away, and that's it. So it's real nice. Uh, a friend of mine is the chef for a uh, professor, uh, professional baseball team, executive chef, Jay Wugrad. The sous chef is a Jay Wugrad as well. Um, they use this type of machine quite a bit. With baseball, games can be somewhat short or take forever if it's a good pitcher's duel. Uh, and so he'll have all of his meats either seared beforehand and put in these bags or in these bags, and all he has to do is quickly sear them, and then he can serve them to the team depending on how long that game takes. There is that debate in the community that uses these types of machines. I prefer to sear afterwards. I feel that way if you sear before and you put in the bag that Maillard browning, it's not caramelization, it's Maillard browning because you're uh, deteriorating the amino acids, the proteins. Caramelization is when you're working with sugars, maybe in the onions that I had. I feel that Maillard browning starts to break apart and it's not as hard. You don't have that nice crust. Uh, now you could sear before, immersion circulate and re-sear afterwards if you really just wanted to kiss it, so to speak, in the pan. You could do that. I, I've I've played with that and that wasn't that bad, but you really do have to pay attention to the temperature because you're searing first, circulating, and then searing again, so that temperature can fluctuate. Yes, sir. It should be food safe in there. Again, the major companies that make those bags are safe to use. Uh, these are food quality bags that we use here at school for the cryovac machines. Um, I wouldn't go to a generic dollar store and buy their plastic bags. I'd spend a little bit extra money. So, uh, I mean, this is something that I'll do not all the time at home, but it does make my life easier. Let's say I want to go out on my property, cut the grass for a couple hours, and do whatever else I have to do. I have a couple acres, um, so I can just put it in here, come back, and then throw leftovers together, throw something together like this. I have two little ones that when they want to eat, they want to eat now. So I'm this, they take after me. I'm the same way. I want food now. Um, so yeah, I would just spend that little bit extra money on the good quality bags. Yes, ma'am. Right. You're not, sh you're not shrinking the protein as much. Okay. Nutritionally, Yes, because you're trapping those proteins in there, okay? You're still deteriorating it a little bit in the pan or grill. You, you always lose a little nutritional value when you heat stuff up, okay? From a complete raw state to a finished cooked state, there is some nutritional values that are lost. I think it's pretty sound because I wouldn't even have to put oil in that. I could just keep it as is with those herbs. But with the herbs and the oil, you get that flavor to spread around a lot better. So, again, trying to use those heart-healthy fats as much as possible. I'm not going to put a cup of oil in there, maybe a couple tablespoons. And then I actually 
when you guys walked in, I had it on the sizzle platter. I had it sitting on that uh, paper towel to take some of that excess fat off. So I knew I was going to be using some in the pan over here. So you're welcome. Yes, ma'am. You can. At, there is, for certain proteins, there is a point of no return. I mean, I wouldn't want to put the salmon in here for 12 hours. Three, four, five, absolutely, that's fine. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So you could prep your food for the week. I usually prep stuff three days out because I know schedules always change. So if I've got three meals that I could easily throw together in my refrigerator, I tend to work PMs here, so I'm 145 to 745 at night. Uh, this coming week is my chef table week for my class, so I have sports teams coming in. I probably won't be getting out of here until 9 o'clock. So either a babysitter or for my wife, I want to make sure that they can pull it out and just have it ready for the family. Oh, yeah, I could have a steak on this side, uh, but then you just have to pay attention to your final internal temperature because the salmon you can get away at a little bit lower. Steak, maybe people want to cook a little more medium or medium well, so you just have to finish it off a certain way. But, yeah, I could, I could easily have different types of protein here, or I could have my uh, carrots on this side. I could have some parsnips on this side. And I just took this out of the classroom so that way you guys can see it. At home, I've got a big lobster pot. That's what I use. Absolutely. So if you're just going to put it on the counter, this is temperature safe. If your counters at home aren't temperature safe, just put a rag underneath. Because again, this water is 120 degrees. So that's it. No, ma'am. Food safe. Food quality ones. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. As far as from low end, I, I don't know. I've never played with that to me. I probably could. I never tried because I've, I've always stuck in about this range. I never really looked at that because that wasn't in my scope of focus at that moment. But you, you can be creative. Um, and you can switch this from Fahrenheit to Celsius so you can get a lot more exact. For days that I can think, you know, I'm not super tired. You know, most days, most days I come home, barely fumble with this, and I just walk away. Yeah. Yes, sir. So my, my class is a little more technology driven. Um, there's about two hours worth of math my students, my senior class, two hours worth of math my seniors have to do before they can even touch food. Uh, because what we do is I'll give them a case study. Let's say it's a, a female gymnast that weighs 100 pounds and has to maintain that weight but has to drop percentage, one percentage of body fat. How do you do that? Knowing are they more aerobic or anaerobic, so are they more power or cardiovascular, so that will determine the range of carbs, protein, and fat. So they'll be sitting there with, in their group of three or four with their calculators, their computers, their phones, coming up with concepts. I always tell them, come up with a concept for your dish. Don't give me a hardcore recipe, because what we do is we actually cook using diabetic exchanges in my class. So I figure out the diabetic exchange not only of carbohydrates, but proteins and fats, so it gets very, very accurate. So they're going to figure out all this math ahead of time, show it to me, they have to be within 3% of an error ratio. And I say, all right, now gram weigh everything out. So then they take out the gram scales. So all the outlets in my kitchen are used. I'm zapping power from other classrooms. Chef Legal is yelling at me sometimes in the hallway. Um, but yes, very technology driven. The students are very technology driven. I mean, they're, they're, one of my kids actually works for IT. He fixed my computer the other day because it wasn't working. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I, I hit things. And he's like, no, I'll just do this. And he got it to work. Uh, but, I mean, they've got recipes, touch with thumb, you know. They're looking up videos on how to do this, on how to butter poach this or whatever it may be. Whereas when we were students and, you know, Google was brand new, you know. And that was hardwired into my computer in my room even before, you know. And there wasn't. I'd have to go to the card catalog and look up recipes using card catalog. You know, so it makes life easier, but then you also deal with shorter attention spans. You know, you have to feed them directions almost like it's a text message. 
poach this. Now sear this. Now, you know, so you have to get that multi-step brain going, which there's a big difference between the kids that are very restaurant focused. They can do that. They can multitask. And the kids that are more nutritional focused, dietetics, science, you know, they seem to think in snapshots at times, whereas the chef students tend to think more that multi-step process. So it's interesting. What other questions do you have? Is this something you guys think you can make at home? Pretty easy. Now, you don't have to use salmon. You can use any type of fish that you want. I like salmon. Um, I've done this with cod, with scup, um, bronzino. So, again, just realize the, the thinner the filet, the shorter the cooking time is going to be. So you might not be able to sear it afterwards. You might just have to merge and circulate and serve that way, which is absolutely fine. So you really got to hit that flavor in that bag. Otherwise, you're going to hit it with some spice and seasoning when it comes out. Yes, sir. Yep, Pharaoh's definitely in right now. Um, actually, when we make... We'll make some doughs in my class for pizzas because a lot of times we're talking stealth health. So we'll make our own pasta dough, our own pizza dough. Uh, one of the greens that I love to use um, is kamut, K-A-M-U-T. It's another ancient grain. Um, again, I can't go 100% fat-free or 100% whole wheat with athletes because they can taste the difference visually. Why is my pasta brown? I want white pasta. So if I can get 30% kamut flour in there, I'm increasing the fiber content, increasing the vitamins, increasing the protein, and that's got a little bit of a buttery flavor, which tends to be real nice. Are you, yeah, do you mill your or do you just we get it pre-milled. Yeah, I would like to start milling, but it would be nice. Yes, sir. Am I running out of time? Yeah, yeah. Whatever spare time that is. Yes. So, thank you guys. Enjoy the weekends. So if you'd like to learn more about how Johnson & Wales is changing the way the world eats and this um, important initiative, you are um, able to go to jwu.edu um, slash eat healthy. And um, there is a ton of information up there about the initiative, um, the overall program at the university, as well as a catalog of recipes. So I was on there the other day. It's amazing how many are on there. So really great ideas for you for um, the home chef. So we encourage you to do that. So thank you for um, that great presentation. That was super interesting, wasn't it? I mean, what a great way to stealth health. I'm going to use that at home. I'm going to put broccoli in things and my son won't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll be like, it was just stealth health, man. Yeah, eat it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> He does not like veggies, so that would be, if I could accomplish that, that would be huge. Um, so thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, our next instructor who's setting right now is uh, Susan Legal, class of 2001, um, also from Johnson & Wales. She's the associate instructor here at the College of Culinary Arts. Um, she's a certified executive pastry chef who is here today to talk to you about pâte Does anybody know what that is? If you haven't looked at your packet. I had no idea. I was like, ooh, this is fancy. And um, it's like an eclair, which I love, but I would never imagine attempting to make that at home. But she has assured me that everyone can do this at home. So I am super excited to learn about this. Uh, one fun fact about Chef Legal is that um, she was recognized as 2016 Teacher of the Year um, as determined. I had to put that in there for you. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to make sure that people knew that about her because that's so cool because that was determined by her fellow um, staff and faculty members from the College of Culinary Arts, so a huge achievement. So we um, appreciate you and thank you so much for all that you do here for our um, pastry students. Um, still while she's setting up, I will mention any of you that are going to the hands-on pastry demo this afternoon after Taste of Jewu, I believe it's at 2 or 2.30. I don't have that in front of me. I apologize. 2.30, thank you. Um, 
uh, Chef Legal heads up the pa- Baking and Pastry Arts Club, and that is the group of students that will be leading you on that adventure this afternoon. So make sure that if you are um, planning to attend that, that you make it there um, right at the start time because you're not going to want to miss this um, delicious. I had some delicious samples. Okay, they're really freaking out, so it's kind of funny. They are? <laughs> They're so awesome. They were setting up yesterday, and they were very precise in their setup, and so it's going to be wonderful. It's always nice to get students involved in a weekend like this um, because, of course, you know, they will be our future graduates and sitting in the seat at reunion weekend someday. So we want to make sure that they know about this experience all along the way. So um, this is exciting for them and for us to have them as involved as possible. Um, I also wanted to take the opportunity to thank our student volunteers that helped us out this morning. Some of them are still in the audience. Um, they helped helped you find your way here, hopefully, um, in addition to the signage, because we know that this is a hard spot to find on campus. So thank you to all of you for helping us. And all along the way, throughout the course of the weekend, you will see student volunteers. Um, so please, you know, at any point in time, have that conversation with them, um, you know, to talk with them about what life is like on campus as well as what they're involved in, um, cause it's a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about programs and, um, activities that are happening, um, with our current students. So that's pretty neat. And then, of course, you know, throughout the day, also, um, making sure that you get to meet anyone and everyone that's here for reunion weekend, um, especially if they were here from a decade before or a decade after from when you graduated, because the campus has evolved so much as I'm sure many of you noticed when you came on campus today. If you haven't been back in a long time, um, it's really cool to hear firsthand about things that are going on um, current day or or in the past. I'm still learning, and I've been here for a really long time. So, did I do enough talking? Okay. Um, anything else? I don't have any jokes. I can't tell you jokes. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I can't do that either. So that's not a good idea. Yes. Hospitality students have classes mostly downtown, um, which we refer to as the Down City Campus. Um, there are some, a lot of the same buildings that were here um, along the way, as well as some new ones. If you're going on a tour um, this afternoon of the John J. Bowen Center for um, Science and Innovation, um, as well as the Physician's Assistant Building. Those are our two newest buildings, Down City. But you will pass some of the um, ones that we may recognize, like John Hayes and White Center and Wales Hall, which is the original building to the university where Ms. Johnson and Ms. Wales held their first classes. Um, Yana Center, things like that. Gaby Commons, where you will catch the shuttles. Did anybody travel by shuttle today? Wildcat shuttle? No? Yes. Okay, great. Um, So I will also say while we're waiting is um, after, okay, thank you. So I was was really running out of things to say. Um, Yes. No. No, I'm sorry. Alumni Supper Club. Yeah, no. Um, No, I know. Bummer. Um, so after this presentation, if you are heading to Taste of Jaywoo and you have your car, we'll be able to help you get back to the parking lot so you can make your way there. If you are taking the shuttle, we'll help direct you to where you could catch that shuttle. Um, and if you later on are interested in taking the shuttle um, to the evening activities, they are being picked up at Gaby Commons. Um, so anybody can uh, with a gold name tag is more than happy to answer any questions that you have throughout the weekend. Please just let us know um, how we can help you, and we're happy to do so. Okay, I'm done talking. Um, Chef Legal. Okay, she can't talk yet. <laughs> okay, take it away. I'm Chef Liao. He's getting a battery for me. Can you hear me? You can hear me from this. All right, I'll stand here for a minute. He's going to fix this. So I'm Chef Liao, and yes, everything she said is true. Um, so um, I'm going to be presenting to you um, patachu techniques. So I've been really into it lately. I don't know why. It just kind of struck my fancy like about a year ago. Thank you. I was, um, you can hear me still? Okay, good. Um, I was, I don't know, I, I guess I was just making something for a class and I got really excited about Padishu and I was like, wow, this is sort of something that's a little bit of a challenge, 
but it's kind of an everyday thing, but you know, I can work on it and work on it and work on it and make it better and better and better. So I've been really excited about it lately. So I'm gonna show you how to make the, the batter and pi do a few different piping techniques, and then I'm gonna show you a couple finished options. So right now I'm just starting this because it takes a little while. I have butter, milk, water, salt, and sugar. It's in the formula packet that you um, have. This is going to spit at me. Um, and that, you just need to kind of bring it to a boil. Super simple. Um, it's almost like making a Bernays. I don't know. I'm, I'm not good at the culinary side. I'm a pastry chef through and through. <laughs> My knives are dull and everything, just like they're <laughs> supposed to be. Um, I... Uh, yeah, I worked, so I'll, I'll give you a little history while we're waiting for this to boil. Um, I worked at mostly hotels in Boston. So I worked at um, the Ritz-Carlton when it was the Ritz-Carlton, the one on Arlington Street in Newbury, the Grand Dam, um, and I miss it dearly. Um, and I also worked at the Langham Hotel, which is uh, another hotel in Boston. Um, I worked out in San Francisco for a little while. I worked out in Arizona for a little while, but not as long as I have been um, here on the East Coast. And then I went back to um, the Grand Dam on 15 Arlington Street to what is now known as Taj Boston, which is a luxury hotel, and weddings and conferences and things like that. So I worked there for quite a long time. So that's kind of my um, history. It's kind of what I think about when I'm teaching my students. I'm always like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Because in a hotel, Tell pastry shop you don't have a lot of time to uh, do anything and uh, you know time is money and all of that so um, that's my experience um, for the most part I was the executive pastry chef at the Taj for four or five years um, and uh, then I came here and I love it um, my husband works here as well so you know we get to see each other a lot more than we used to because you know 16 hours in a bake shop versus the time we spend here is a lot different so um, that's kind of my experience level. And um, as I've been teaching here, I've started teaching, I think I started with sophomores actually, which is a little odd. Mostly you start with freshmen and you kind of work your way up. But I started with sophomore level pastry students and then I went down to freshmen for a little while. And now I teach all four years, just randomly interspersed. So it's very interesting when I go from a freshman class to a senior class because I'm like, whoa. <laughs> there's a big difference. Um, so it's really nice because I get to kind of experience all of the students and their different levels of uh, experience and their levels of like understanding. Uh, I'm starting a class on Thursday where the students are totally driving their entire production. Like all I do is kind of hang around and get ingredients for them and say, oh, you're not really supposed to do that, <laughs> you know, or something to that effect. Um, so they're driving their whole production, and at the end of the class, they have a huge buffet. And um, it's so great to see how much they've learned over the course of four years, because I can remember them in pies and tarts class tearing their pie dough as they're trying to roll it out. So, you know, it was pretty fun. Um, so this it needs to come to a boil, and I don't know how to work this burner. There we go. And basically, pat shoe is a roux kind of like a roux. A roux is usually just water and flour, but there's a couple extra things in here because we're pastry chefs and we like butter and sugar and salt. Um, so uh, sort of a roux that's then thinned down with eggs. And um, so you need kind of two pieces of equipment. You need a pot stove and you need a mixer. If you didn't have a mixer, you could do it by hand. You would get a sore arm, but you could do it by hand. Um, you don't need anything really fancy, even if you just had one of those uh, stick paddle mixer type deals that would work just as well. Um, so this is now boiling and I like to use a wooden spoon for this. It's a little bit old fashioned but I like to use a wooden spoon for this. It just seems to work really well. Um, and as soon as this comes to a boil you're just adding flour. All right. I made a special blend of flour um, but you could use any pastry flour or all-purpose flour. Um, the all-purpose flour we get at the school is quite intense in protein so I like to cut it a little bit with cake flour because that has less protein. So as soon as you add the flour, you're still keeping it on the heat, and you're just mixing it, and you'll see, I don't know if you guys can see the pot or not, but um, it just kind of has to, kind of, it looks a little gross, and then eventually it kind of turns into a dough. There we go. Ooh, this, I'm used to induction burners lately. We have induction burners in our classes, so this is like hot stuff over here. So you can see it kind of got really stiff. And now it's starting to pull to a ball in the center of the pot. So you can kind of see got a little ball going on. And as soon as that happens, you're going to give it maybe another 30 seconds to a minute. Um, obviously, if you're doing a really big batch, you maybe need a little longer time. But about 30 seconds to a minute, just to kind of dry this out a little bit, you get a little skin on the bottom of the pot, and which makes it awful to clean, but that's life. Um, I don't think the dishwasher would do it. So as soon as this kind of does this 30 seconds or so, you can see it's kind of turned into almost like a dough. 
yeah so then it goes right into the mixer right from there that goes right in there and then immediately goes right onto low speed with a paddle I give it about a minute give or take to just kind of steam out you know get a little bit of the um, excess moisture out and then I'll just start adding eggs and the funny part about patashu is that the eggs are variable so you might use them all you might need one more you might need a little bit of one more or you might need not as many as you have um, and it really just depends on the consistency and I um, put it in the packet it's kind of like a little step by step of this process and what the batter should look like as you're done making it so I will kind of show you that as we go so while I'm adding the eggs to this I'm gonna add them slowly probably one at a time you kinda wanna let one combine in before you add the next one I'm gonna just set up my little um, piping station here so there's two different there's a lot of different techniques of how to pipe pad shoe, but I'm gonna show you two types that I like one is just a regular like profiterol sort of a round shape and one is more of an eclair style so the elongated um, sort of hot dog type shape I guess you could say um, and I like to use this particular piping tip and it's um, it's a French style piping tip and it's got a lot of teeth on it compared to a normal star where you only have about six little tines this one's got well I'm not going to count but it's got a lot um, and that actually creates a striation on the side of the eclair so that when it rises in the oven it splits on the striation instead of exploding at random points that's what I find happens to a lot of people um, is they they come actually I had a student the other day a former student email me pictures of her clairs and goes well, what happened and I said use this tip and use this recipe and um, it all went fine so um, this helps to kind of keep your eclairs nice and shapely long sort of thin narrow um, I don't know if you guys are on Instagram if you follow a lot of chefs I know I do and um, eclairs are huge right now and everyone who makes them they're all perfect and I'm like how do they do that so that's what I'm striving for I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but we'll see. Um, and then the other one is just a profiterol, and that's like a really go-to shape for like any kind of dessert you wanted to do. You can just do regular plain patashu with no flavorings, and you can just fill them with vanilla ice cream and serve them with chocolate sauce. That's very classic. You could also um, top them with a little bit of this shoe sable, we like to call, which I'll show you how to use in a minute. And or you can add um, savory ingredients to it. So at the bottom of the recipe that I gave you, there's a little list of savory ingredients you can add to this mix, and you can create like gougeres, what we call gougeres. They're like cheese puffs. They're like amazing, and you want to eat a thousand of them when you taste them. But they make like a really good appetizer if you know you have people over or whatever. So you can see that this mixture. I don't know if you guys can see in the mixture. I'll show you in a minute. It's kind of it's a little chunky. It's a little strange looking. As the eggs come in, it gets very, very, very nice and smooth, very pipeable, very soft. Um, if it's too soft, obviously you've added too much eggs. If it's not soft enough and it doesn't pipe well, you need a little bit more. And sometimes with a batch this small on a mixer this big, I have to go in by hand at the end and kind of get it together. Um, what can I do while I'm waiting for that? While I'm waiting for this last little bit, does anybody have any questions about anything unrelated to what I'm doing? It's fine too. Yes. I'm sorry? You probably could. I have not tried it personally yet. I haven't gotten that far in my, uh, my patashu mastery. Um, but I think as long as you have something that has like the gums in it that are needed for sort of the gluten development. I think I've used cup for cup before. Have you guys used that? Um, I find it to be really strong. So I cut it with like rice flour or oat flour or something other that, that's also gluten free. Um, and that seems to work really well for a lot of different recipes, so maybe it would work well for this. I'm just going to assume I need all of these eggs. I really probably shouldn't have done that, but I did. Too late. It's too late. Yes. <sighs> I... I've ne I, I generally would be like, okay, I'm starting over. But um, <laughs> I think if you if you were like, well, I have nothing to lose, you could probably try to add a little flour. It's not cooked. But again, it's going in the oven too, so you might be able to just absorb a little of that moisture. That's probably what I would, buy, would try if I was going to try. Um, with my students, they oftentimes are like, oh, chef, it's too runny. And I'm like, there's the trash. <laughs> Start again. Only because we want them to learn the correct way and stuff like that. But, you know, in a pinch, I'd probably add flour. 
So I'm going to pull this off the mixer now just because I feel like I could get it done faster if I was doing it by hand. Um, no, actually a whisk, for me a whisk would incorporate more air than a paddle. So I would rather not have that. And I think a paddle does a better job of sort of blending ingredients together. Um, with a whisk, that roux would be so thick at the beginning, it would just get stuck in there. I don't think it would blend the same way. Right. Yeah, it's not really about air incorporation for this particular um, item. So, yeah, slow is fine. I could speed it up, but I would rather just do it by hand as opposed to incorporating too much air. So the last little bit, just scrape down the bowl, and I'm really just kind of emulsifying it a little bit, just trying to get all those um, liquid right into that roux and get it nice and smooth. I'm going to sweat a little bit right now. Sorry. <laughs> so big difference from what came off of the pot. So it's got sort of a elastic, and if I did that test, it would hold a string, and that's kind of what you're looking for. Um, I remember in school I learned the track test, which was like you drag your finger through it, and if it like closed within five seconds or something like that, it was good. So I've done that, but I don't know. I feel like now I'm just more like, looks all right, you know? So that's kind of how I go. <laughs> It's funny, too, because it's, sometimes it's really hard to teach, you know? I'm like, well, it looks good. They're like, well, what are you looking for? I'm like, well, I don't really know. But it looks good. <laughs> so it's, it took me a long time as I started teaching to realize how I had to say things to get people to understand what I was talking about, you know? It's like folding. I never knew how hard it would be to teach someone how to fold something. I was like, down, left, pull the bowl, keep doing that over and over again, and it was so complicated. I was like, this isn't hard, really. They're like, chef, it's hard. It's like, okay. <laughs> So I'm going to put a little bit of this batter into the star tip that I was talking about. And I'm going to focus more on eclairs than I am on the rounds, only because I feel like it's a little more challenging. So when you are piping, and I think anyone who does any baking at home should just go buy a roll of these disposable piping bags and call it a day because they're like the best thing ever. I never, ever want to wash a piping bag again in my life. And I don't think I will. So, um, so I just have this filled up a little bit, and I like to use um, a paring knife in my piping technique. So what a traditional eclair, I think someone would just, well, I'll show you one. I'm not going to bake these, so I won't have to look at the ugliness later. Um, but a traditional technique would just be to pipe a straight line and then pull back. And what you see is that it's not super duper even. And even if I was like the most perfect piper in the world, which I know I'm not, um, it probably would still not be super duper even. So when that bakes, it'll bake in sort of like a dog bone shape and you'll have like a thicker start and then it won't be nice and straight. Um, and I know that there are definitely cheating methods out there. You can go buy silicone molds and just pipe the patashu into the silicone mold and it rises right up the way it's supposed to. But if you want to do it the old fashioned way, I like to use a um, knife and it takes a little coordination because you have to use your left hand or right hand at the same time, which I'm not always good at. But the more straight you hold the bag, the even, the more even you'll pipe, and then you just drag. I can't talk while I'm doing this, sorry. And then when you want to stop, you stop the pressure, you put the knife down and pull up. And then you end up like a super crisp end, and that really helps to like keep them all the right size and shape. So just kind of show that again. I've actually even taken patashu batter and piped a really long strip, froze it, pulled it out of the freezer, chopped it into the size I wanted and baked it. But the ends tend to be square and I think that looks a little weird. So, But that's the basic idea. So we'll do one more. We'll call it a day on this one. And I'll move on to the others. So it's pretty easy because it gives you a nice crisp end. And that's it. Now from here, what I like to do with eclairs is I like to bake them straight away. Um, some people will say you can freeze them and bring them back to room temperature and egg wash them and bake them, and by all means, yes, you can. But I prefer to put these in the oven pretty much right after I pipe the sheet pan and bake them because the longer they sit out, the more they get a skin. The more they get a skin, the more likely they are to sort of explode in funny spots in the oven as they rise. Um, so having like sort of a moist environment or having like no skin at all helps them to bake more even in my world. This sink is going to be full of weird things by the time I'm done. <laughs> so I'm going to put those there, and then I'm going to show you the other um, the other thing. You know what I can do? Here we go. A little cheating method here. Be more speedy. 
What time am I supposed to be done, Lori? How much am I, like, how much am I supposed to be done? I just want to know. Oh, okay, good. Ha ha. Get to bore you for another half hour. All right, so that was sort of cheating, but there it is. So when you're doing a round, which I think is a little bit more uh, common, I guess you could say, um, a lot of people want to do like a swirl. So they want to pipe and they want to... And that actually creates sort of a profiterole that's all lopsided and has funny cracks in it. So if you pipe straight and round, um, it, it takes a little bit of uh, practice getting even pressure. And I'm actually going to pipe on the other side of this, just so you can see, because it's kind of hard to see with the dip of the pan. But if you just hover and squeeze stop the pressure and then cut off you end up with like a perfect little mound and that's going to rise really nice and even it's going to be really rounded and beautiful in shape and then you know you can say that they're all the same and when you're serving them to people the floor is really sticky back here i'm like sticking to the floor um so you know just to kind of get that and of course ideally you can pipe a sheet pan of these in under a minute i don't know if you can do that i don't even know if i can do that anymore but you get the idea. So you'd pipe, and of course, the larger you pipe, the bigger the shoe. This is actually going to um, mimic about the size of the ones that I have for you to taste, which I'm holding in reserve so that you don't rush the stays now. Um, and and to um, so for John's presentation, Chef John, he's he's all nutrition, um, no nutrition. <laughs> so I'm sorry, this is not good for you in any particular way. Although there is lemon. And lemon's good for you, right? I sort of. Sorry. So I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do this because there's no freezer back there, but I'll try. So this is called um, pâte de sable, and it's really just butter, sugar, and flour paddled together until it's dough, and then you roll it out really thin. I rolled it between two pieces of plex, um, polyethylene, which is like a acetate used for chocolate, just because of, then you could see it. Um, you could use parchment paper or wax paper, whatever you have. And I'm going to try. Usually I freeze this. There you go. At least it came off that way. Usually you freeze it, and then you pull it out of the freezer and pull off all the plastic or the parchment, and then cut it out. If I can get it done without freezing it, that will be good. We'll see. We'll see how I do. But this actually is something that you can make, or you don't have to. So it's your choice. This is going to give it a sweet, crispy, crunchy top, if that's what you choose to have. And I also find it helps with the shape. So if you're really looking for something super even and, and perfect, put this on top because it helps to keep everything nice and rounded as opposed to like sometimes they'll rise this way, sometimes they'll split there, sometimes they'll split there. So so you'll take a set of, you know, round cookie cutters, whatever, um, about the same size or a little bit smaller than what you've piped and you just cut out this disc. I don't, like I said, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this because it's really hot in here, but we will try. Ooh. Ah, oh, success. And then you would just, and this is usually frozen, so it doesn't like bend, but you would just put it right on top, and then you bake those. So you would do all of those just like that. And it just gives it a nice crispy top. That doesn't affect the rise at all. It does a little bit. So um, this size and shape, as if I baked it as is, um, would probably be a little bit round or a little puffier. This is going to weigh it down slightly, so it's going to give it a little more of a that shape as opposed to that. And it depends on what you're looking for um, for the final product and to, you know, how, if that matters to you. So the baking process on pâte choux, and like I said, you can do it at home. You have to know your oven really well. I think that's the most important thing is just knowing your oven and knowing, um, you know, is it correct temperature-wise? Like I know mine at home, like I set it to 400, it's really 425. Um, but anyway, uh, you need to know your oven really well and you need to realize that you can't do multiple things at once with the oven while you're baking pâte choux. So if you put the pâte choux in, you're supposed to put it in around 400. And about 8 to 10 minutes later, you, do, you can peek at them real quick. You don't want to open the oven for good because they'll crash, come crashing down because it's all about the air on the inside. Um, you can kind of peek at them. If they're just starting to get a little color and they've puffed, you can turn the temperature of your oven down to about 320, 350, somewhere in that neighborhood, and then let them bake until they're nice and golden. Once they've got the color that you're looking for, and they do have to be kind of dark to hold their structure. If you pull them too early, they will like collapse on you. Um, but as soon as they're dark brown, you say, okay, I like that color. Then if they're not quite dry enough, say if you break one open, it's still kind of got a lot of spider webbing on the inside, you can let it sit in a lower temperature oven, even lower or even with a uh, temperature that's off but just warm, and let them dry out 
all together. Um, the idea of a pate is to have a nice hollow center so that you can fill it with uh, a, like a lovely cream or something like that, something tasty. Um, if you're doing gougeres, like I had suggested, the cheese ones, you don't generally fill those. So then you would just kind of bake them to the color you like and pull them. And if they're a little moist on the inside, it's okay. So, so the shoe has been piped and now it needs to be filled. And because I'm doing a lemon meringue eclair, I also need to make meringue. So before I go into all of this, I am going to quickly start the Italian meringue for the topping, just because it takes a little while to cook. So Italian meringue is, it sounds really hard, but it's really very easy. Um, um, any meringue is um, egg whites and sugar. The general ratio is two parts sugar to one part egg whites. Um, when you are doing a basic meringue, something that does not require any heat, you just put egg whites in a bowl with them with sugar, that ratio of two to one is really hard to achieve. One to one is probably more achievable because granulated sugar is really heavy, trying to whip egg whites really fluffy and then get all this granulated sugar in just tends to make the egg whites kind of collapse and they don't want to stay up nice and fluffy. So um, when you're doing a two to one ratio, I suggest a Swiss meringue or an Italian meringue. A Swiss meringue is where you would put egg whites and granulated sugar in a bowl, put them over a double boiler under like boiling water, and get them up to about 220 to 200, and, I'm sorry, not 200, 120 to 145 degrees Fahrenheit, and all the sugar dissolves, so you have sort of like a hot egg mixture, and then you put it on a mixer and let it whip. I say 120 because that's sort of the known temperature, but if you cook eggs to 120 degrees, they are not food safe, right? 145 for 15 seconds is where you need to be to have eggs at a food safe temperature that you can technically eat them without worry of salmonella or anything like that. So we push our egg whites a little further, get them up to 145 just to make sure they're safe because we're using fresh egg whites, and then we whip them. So it takes a little longer to get it cool, but it's fine. As long as you continue to whisk over the double boiler so you don't like cook them, then you're fine. Um, but I think, personally, Italian, and it's probably because I'm half Italian, um, you can tell, right, because I talk with my hands, um, <laughs> I do a lot, uh, an Italian meringue is just as, um, I feel like it's just as time consuming as Swiss meringue, but better in general, just better, you know, it just has a silkier, smoother texture, it's easier to use, and you don't have to worry about that whole 145 degree, don't cook the eggs over the double boiler, double boiler thing. So, I have a two to one ratio here. Most of the sugar, not every single bit of it, but most, with the exception of about an ounce, is going to go into this pot. All right, and it's just a nice, nice clean pot. And then I'm going to take a little water, and I'm just going to let it wet all of the sugar in the pot. And I'm trying not to get any sugar on the sides of the pot. I'm trying to like make sure that I'm not splashing it around, because if any sugar is stuck on the sides of the pot, chances of it crystallizing and ruining my whole sugar syrup are pretty high. So as soon as I'm done there, I'm just going to turn this on. I'm still a little wary of this burner. Makes me nervous. Okay, so that's going. This needs to come all the way up to, to the end temperature of 245 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's going to take a while. Not a whole long time, but definitely more than it's going to take me to put egg whites in a bowl. There. There it is. <laughs> done. So egg whites are going to go in your bowl. This little bit of sugar is going to be reserved to start these whites when I need to start whipping them. I don't want to start whipping them now. Um, egg whites in motion stay in motion. It's like a little coin phrase. I use them all, all of my students, and they're like, oh, roll their eyes at me because they're like, chef, you've said that a thousand times. I was like, it's true. So egg whites in motion stay in motion. That basically means that as soon as a meringue is ready or as soon as egg whites are whipped and they're ready to go, you can't let them sit around. They can't stop and just sit there. They'll deflate. They get kind of funny. Um, they kind of chunk up, and then they're not nice and smooth and beautiful and flexible anymore. So I don't want to start this too early. We have to sort of keep these in sync. So what I do to keep these in sync is I have a nice handy-dandy thermometer here. Bed, bath, and beyond. Go to the beyond section. All right? Because it's not bed, and it ain't bath. So, um, so you go to the beyond section. You buy this. It's $20, and it's a lifetime guarantee. So I break them on a six-month like rotation because I use them a lot and I go and I'm like and they hand me a new one it's good no one works there right okay because I try to go to different ones every time I do it so they don't got like got my number you know because um, it's not technically for professional use but like I kind of use it for professional use so uh, <laughs> but I really there's no better thermometer that I have found yet I mean those nice beautiful like glass sugar thermometers are like beautiful to look at until you drop it 
which I my students have done. So I'm like, well, I'm not buying those. They're twenty dollars, and I don't get that back. So this is the best, and it has a timer, and it has an alert, which is really nice. Um, so I could set the temp to anything I wanted, stick the thermometer in, and go do something else, and not. Um, make that carbon <laughs> by burning it, which I used to do a lot um, as a student. So I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna put it in just yet. I'll wait till all the sugar's dissolved. It's kind of safer that way. And uh, always you have to be careful of the flame and your, you know, nice plastic thing. So here, so that's cooking, that's doing its thing. This is good to go. So while I'm like kind of waiting on this, I'm gonna fill my pat -a shoe So the baked product here, I'm not wearing gloves. The samples, I wear gloves, I promise, okay. Um, Pretty nice, right? It's small. I like to do small eclairs. I don't usually do huge ones. Um, even split on that side and that side to keep the top really nice. Okay? So that is generally what happens. Occasionally you get this. It's got a little like split right down the center. But I'm going to cover that so it's going to be okay. All right? And then this is the round. And that's got the crispy top on it. So you can see it's got like a different texture on top. And it's a little bit more, um, I don't know, UFO shaped, if you will. Um, but I, you know, it's still got a hollow center and it's still really beautiful and nice to eat. All right. So what I have here is lemon cream. And I'm going to say this. It's the best lemon cream ever. Okay. Ever. Or if, uh, if you're from Rhode Island or Mass Eva. Okay. There we go. Um, so I'm sharing it with you. So you should make it at home. It's really easy. Just like kind of throw everything except for the butter and the gelatin in a bowl um, in a pot and just whisk until it's thick. Super simple. Um, and then you add gelatin. I add gelatin for stability. Depending on what you want to do with it, you don't need gelatin at all. I mean, if you just want to like have it as a sauce over something, then you don't really need it. But for this, just to be thick enough so it doesn't ooze out, I like a little gelatin. So you could probably put agar in it as well, yes. Either way, um, I have found that for the most part, I have been able to swap sheet gelatin and powdered gelatin in most of my formulas. And the powdered gelatin is a little stronger, but not enough to be like, oh my God, too strong. So especially with this, because what I do is as soon as it's done setting, like overnight, I take it and I paddle it back to like a thinner sort of pipeable consistency. So it just breaks the gelatin down a little bit. Um, well, you have to bloom it properly. So powdered gelatin, um, usually if you like buy a box of it, it tells you how much water to use to bloom how much, you know, so you'd have to figure out the ratio of water to gelatin that you need. With the sheet gelatin, you can just submerge it in ice water and just pull it out, squeeze it, throw it into whatever you're putting it in. Um, so with powdered gelatin, just you just have to do a little more math, I guess. So it works out. It's a very complicated formula. It's basically bloom strength of what you have. All right, let me see if I remember this because I do it with French recipes all the time. It's like bloom strength of what you have. So each gelatin type has a different bloom strength. Powdered gelatin has a certain bloom strength that, like, I don't even know the number off the top of my head. It's like maybe it's 220. I don't know. And then um, silver is 160. And it just depends on how much. I don't even know what the number really means. It's something like about how much gelatin it takes to set one liter of liquid or something like that. So you have to kind of convert, and it's not just a straight conversion. It's like converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. It's not just like, oh, 32 equals zero. That means like 64 equals 32. You know, it doesn't work that way. So it's kind of a complicated formula. Um, I do it with French recipes a lot because the French gelatin is a lot um, stronger. So my students come back from France on their internship, and they're like, I want to use this recipe. And I'm like, mm, yeah, it's not going to set. So, um, you know, we have to do a lot of math. But they're always so surprised. So super easy to fill these. You just poke a little hole in the bottom. I used a, um, an extra little star tip, but you can use kind of anything, um, you know, paring knife or a thermometer probe or something like that. And then you just take this and this. I just have another star tip on here. Sometimes you can even poke the hole and fill at the same time if you want to. Um, and just squeeze it in. And you kind of go until it starts to explode, and then you're done. Um, occasionally, I've had one pop out the other end. That's a little messy, but uh, it happens. Absolutely. So this is lemon cream, so it's definitely hazardous. It's got, you know, the eggs and everything. So as soon as I was to fill these and decorate them, I would keep them in the refrigerator um, until I needed to serve them. They have about a four-hour window, as does most, um, you know, ha potentially hazardous food. You know, you can keep it out for about three to four hours, and then you want to throw it away. But um, so those have not been out that long, I promise. 
So for eclairs, I poke two holes in the bottom. You can't really see them, but they are there. Um, just to make sure that I fill it well. That's the hardest part about pat shoe especially when you're serving it to people that are going to know the difference, is that if you don't fill it all the way, they're like, oh, but it's hollow, and there's nothing in there. And so it's you kind of have to feel the weight and kind of get a good sense of, oh, I didn't poke holes in that one. Hello. There we go. So this is now at 2.32, which is the perfect time to start whipping whites. So I always wait until about 230 degrees on my sugar syrup before I start this meringue. kind of gives me good timing. I'm looking for a final temp of 2.45 on this, as I had said, so I'll kind of sort of turn it down a little so I don't get there too fast. And I'm just turning this on quite high speed, and as soon as it gets really, really fluffy, I'm just going to sprinkle in this little bit of granulated sugar. This is going to help so that when I put this really hot sugar syrup into these egg whites, they don't cook. Sugar is sort of a heat absorber, so it kind of helps. Anything that has a lot of sugar in it isn't going to burn or cook as fast or anything like that. So. Sugar flying. So I got a couple more degrees to go. I can turn this down a little bit, but I know it's not going to need to go that fast for that long. Very loud. Very loud. I'll finish my little job here. Pastry is all about multitasking. Just going to say that. <laughs> all right, so I filled enough. I don't need to fill those. Someone asked me a question. Oh, yeah. As well. Absolutely. No, I really actually try not to. <laughs> my mom, though, when she cooks Thanksgiving dinner, every pot in the house. Every single one. All right. So this is at the appropriate temperature. And there will be a little overcooking. So I'm really expecting this to be at about 248 by the time that I put it into the egg mixture. And the key to success here is to make sure that this goes in right down the side of the bowl. If you hit the whip with this, you're going to have like a spider web of sugar. If I was to take my fingers and put them in ice water and then plunge them into this hot sugar syrup real quick and pull out a little piece, I could roll it into a ball. All right, it's called soft ball stage. It's not super hard. Um, obviously, I don't like doing that. It's kind of risky, but um, <laughs> you could do it. I've seen chefs do it, and I'm like, I don't know if I'm willing. Um, so as long as I pour this right down the side of the bowl, I might hit the bowl a little bit, but I will not hit the whip, and I will be able to create an easy meringue. And medium speed is great for mixing this. If you go on high, you're liable to splash yourself with sugar. It's not good. And just go slow at first, and then eventually you can kind of speed up the process. <laughs> I made a lot. I really don't know why I made so much. I don't need that much, but that's okay. There we go. So this is good to soak, most definitely, because the sugar is just going to harden on the inside of the pot. Enough space in there. <laughs> we'll soak it later. <laughs> I'll be scrubbing that later on today. It'll be all right. So now I just need to let this ride for about... 10 minutes or so. What I like is I like to use it still slightly warm. It keeps it flexible longer. It pipes nicer and smoother. Um, so it just, you know, it's nicer. So while I wait on that meringue, I'm just going to set up my final little display here. Um, torch. Now I know you probably don't have one of these at home, but Home Depot, really, I mean, Home Depot is like a pastry chef paradise. Um, but they do sell small ones, you know, like Sir Table or something like that, like the little tiny ones. But we don't have those here at the school, so here it is. Um, you could technically use the oven to brown your meringue, but I don't like to put lemon cream and pat in a 500-degree oven for five minutes. It like, just doesn't sound appealing to me. Um, a lemon meringue pie, sure, why not? Um, but because of that, I prefer the torch, and it's really just something that you might, like my husband has one of these for, you know, working in the workshop and stuff. So I'm like, oh, I need that. <laughs> his first experience frying a turkey, he had four of them set up around the bottom of his pot. I was like, we need to get you a turkey fryer. Like, this is, this is like a fire waiting to happen. Okay, sorry, you're gonna have to start again because that was like...
No. Not meringue. Meringue is not heat sensitive the way, I think you're thinking Chantilly or whipped cream. When you do whipped cream, you need to have cold equipment because cream doesn't do well in, in like hot temperatures or anything like that. But a meringue is not heat sensitive, which makes it really nice for, for certain applications. Like if I wanted to make a really nice lemon mousse, all I would do is um, melt down my lemon cream, fold in an Italian meringue. It's beautiful. It's nice and light. There's not a lot of fat in it. I mean, comparatively, there's still definitely butter in lemon cream, but there's not a lot compared to something where you would just take um, like whipped cream and fold in heavy cream, you know, so much different. So I didn't let this go the full a length of time, but I'm all right with that. So you can see that this is beautiful and shiny. It's a little soft, but that's all right. I will deal. Not much. Not much. Ratio of ingredients. And you know what? I think I just call it lemon cream because I like that better than lemon curd. <laughs> I don't think there's a, a big uh, technical aspect to that. I'll be scrubbing that later too. So um, I have a couple different ideas here. So the first one is sort of the I don't have a lot of equipment and I don't have a lot of time. And then the second one is, I don't know why I'm going to start using gloves now, but I am. Um, <laughs> I'm just, it's, like, it's like habit, I guess. And the second one is I have a little more time and I'm a little bit more fancy, so I want to be a little more fancy. So for the round um, profiteroles or pas de whatever you want to call them, I, for the ones that I made for you guys, I did sort of like a, a kind of a take on a lemon meringue pie and the way a lemon meringue pie would look. All right, so lemon meringue pie in a sort of traditional sense, it's just mounded with meringues, kind of pulled up in peaks everywhere and torched or brulee. So an easy kind of fun thing to do is just take this guy, dip it in the meringue, give it a pull, and there it is, you know. Now, here we go. This is what I can show. Of course, I've got meringue all over my hands now. Lovely. Didn't plan that out very well. Sorry. And like I said, I should have let that meringue go a little longer, but I don't know. I don't like listening to that mixer probably any more than you do, so we're just going to wing it. And it's kind of cute, you know. It's a little, little um, organic, if you will, right? It's not like super pastry chef 101, but, you know, but it's still, like, complicated enough. And it looks cute. And you can get a little, like, Hershey Kiss going on there. So I did that. That was kind of what I did for that particular design. I am going to let this go a little longer on the mixer while I finish those. And then I will just put that there. I don't like getting the table dirty, like when I haven't started, you know. Just needs to be like a little more shiny for the other design that I want to do. So with the torch, ideally you want to get the one where you can adjust the flame. There's a couple different types. You can do the one that you just click on and it's like whoosh, super high heat, a little scary. This one you have to twist and then you can kind of bring down to something a little more manageable. And then you just have to kind of go in quick. If you go in too long, you'll burn it. So you just want to go in quick. Obviously, I'm not putting this on parchment for a very good reason. We've done that before, too. And depending on how brown you like your meringue, you can kind of do what you want to do. I don't prefer it to be super dark, so. Those are those. There we go. That's better. All it needed was a little bit more time. So this is a little stiffer now and a little bit more shiny. And this is actually perfect for the, or for both actually, it would work for both, but for the um, other design I'm gonna do, this is maybe a little more finesse. Um, but this is something still like three ingredients, you know, three recipes, not so much when it comes down to it. And I think for summertime or for springtime, it's super nice because it's, you know, it's lemon and it's pat -shoe. it's not very heavy. So to follow a, very healthy meal like salmon with um, fancy quinoa, whatever, whatever. Um, <laughs> this would work, I think. I have all, all sorts of respect for nutritionists, but I am not one of them. I could not figure it out. So I have a, um, if you've ever seen a buttercream rose before, buttercream flour, I have a tip that is very similar to that in this bag. 
and it's kind of a blade. It sort of looks like a petal. It's hard to tell until I actually pipe, so I'll kind of go for it. Sorry, I don't have any um, temperature sensitivity on my hands anymore, so I'm like, is this warm still? I'm going to pipe on chocolate, and I want to make sure I'm not going to melt the chocolate. So I have these little gold boards, and this is like, if you want to get really fancy. Otherwise, you can just take a plate. That one's dirty. That one's clean. And these are like what, if you go to a hotel, you'll see these. So just to give the eclair something to uh, stick to. I know the, the filling is down there, but you never know if that's actually going to help. Put these down. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try two different kinds. So this one, I'm not going to use a chocolate piece. Because if you think about it, I have to pipe this. I have to torch it on chocolate. Hmm. Maybe not going to work. So I'm going to try. <laughs> but this is a nice tip, and it's kind of a trendy little thing to do these days, is to do a, like a ribbon wave. So you just kind of... Try one with chocolate just for fun. So if I'm going to do the chocolate, I'm going to put a little more meringue down just so I can kind of glue it. I find the chocolate just kind of gives you something nice to pipe onto. I'll do two in case the first one doesn't work out. I'm going to try. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm going to try. <laughs> Give it a shot, right? So I think it's all about control and angle. So this one I don't have to worry about so much. So I can just kind of go at it in any particular direction I want. This one, however, come up from underneath. Oh, yeah, that works. That's a thing. I wasn't really sure, and I was like, why not? I'll just try it. They won't judge me. Right? Right. There you go. <laughs> as long as you know what's going to happen, right? All right, so just be really careful, and you can get that done if you really want to. So, you know, tempering chocolate is something not everyone's up to. That's why I think it's just as easy to go that route. But if you want to get extra fun... And then just because I am who I am, and I'm a garnisher, so I worked at the Ritz-Carlton, I worked at the Taj Boston, all like kind of high-end hotels, did lots of Mother's Day brunches and things like that. Everything had to be garnished like a thousand. You know, it couldn't just be this. It had to be garnished. So I'm going to garnish because it's who I am, so I can't help myself. And these were supposed to be chips, and it is so hot out. They are now more like fruit leather, but that's cool. <laughs> I'm fine with that. <laughs> they still hold their shape. It's fine. They're just lemon slices. So I just sliced a lemon on like really thin on a mandolin or whatever you got. And um, I actually just let them dry at room temperature. If you wanted to force them in the oven, you could put them at a low temperature oven for a long time. They become chips. Um, like I said, if I had done that, they might not be more like fruit leather, but we'll see. So you could do something like that. I didn't. Inc I think I included that in the formula packet. I think I did. There's lots of other things. You could just throw a little zest on there as well, you know, if you want more of a fresh lemon flavor. Um, but you'll tell me, but I think that the inside speaks for itself. No one would be surprised that it's lemon. And, of course, these little chips, not, while not necessary, do help to kind of identify your food, too, if you're doing more of a buffet type thing and you don't want to spend the time to make labels, which people don't read anyway. I don't really know why I even bother half the time. And, you know... You can do gold leaf. I told you I'm a garnisher. I can't help myself. So gold leaf is something that not everyone has kicking around, but it certainly makes stuff look nice. So if it'll stick, of course. There we go. And this is 100% edible. 24 karat gold leaf. And there you go. Right on time. So now, if you would like to eat or try, 
I did make some for you. I don't know if I have enough. I think I do. I don't know how many people you are, but I have plenty. I didn't count. And I will also open up the floor for questions. So if anyone has anything they want to ask or no, anything at all. Yes. Unfortunately not. What happens, and you might even see it with the, my bag. I don't know where I threw my bag, but um, as it sits in the bag, it solidifies. Not to the point of, like, not coming out, but you'll see if you come up here and look at it really closely, it's very air bubbly, and eventually it'll start to tear and dry. So it's not, this is not something you'd want to use, but you could definitely do Chantilly or buttercream or something of that nature as long as you had it kept at the right temperature. So, unfortunately. Any other questions? You guys want to eat? Come on up and eat. It's nice. Thank you so much, Chef Legal. Big round of applause. That was awesome. Awesome. I want to take. And thank you for the samples. That's even more awesome. Yeah. Um, and I feel so inspired. I'm going to try this. We'll see how successful I am. I'm going to guess it's going to be a thumbs down. If anybody needs help getting to their next location, please see myself. Or we also have three students here who have volunteered to stay to help you get to your next location. Seconds, if that is taste and you're taking the shuttle, we can direct you as to where to go. If you are heading back to the parking lot, we can also help you find your way. And uh, feel free to come on up, take a sample, and speak with the chef. Thank you. But because I put it in a sweet application, right, right. it helps with the browning, too. Uh, you know?